Why don't you turn to your neighbor, tell them this today, say, you look like you've lost 20 pounds. Just tell them that, even if you got to lie to them this morning. Uh, one of the girls at Fearless said, I have had so much fun at Fearless, and I, I have had, I've eaten everything that I can eat, and therefore I will not, my neighbor will not be able to honestly tell me I look like I lost 20 pounds tomorrow in church. She knew you were going to say it. She knew. Hey, how many of you ladies had a good time at Fearless this weekend? Man, it was, it was incredible, and I just want to thank everybody that volunteered to put it on. I think there were over 250 women in the house, and, and I was kind of sneaking around up here. I came in some of the services to look in, and just the anointing was moving in the room, and the Word of God was so rich. I was, I was incredibly encouraged. So let's, get, let's give all of our volunteers a big hand clap for putting that on. Thank you so much. I was on cloud nine about fearless, and then I went home and watched the UK game yesterday. Mountains and, uh, to valleys. Yeah, from mountains to valley. But what I do to make myself feel better whenever we lose a game is I start randomly calling phone numbers in Tennessee, prank calling them and telling them it's the bank, their mortgage is past due, we're repossessing their house. So if you ever feel bad, that's the move. Amen? A little pastoring, no big deal. Yeah, pastoring okay. the people. Well, hey, let's do this. We're on part three today of marriage moments, and uh, we're going to teach and talk about where we invest in our marriage. So I want us just to take one moment. I want us to pray. Let's invite the presence of God. He's already here, but let's let him know he's welcome to move in our, in our life. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the Spirit of God. We thank you that we are never alone, but you're always with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. I pray right now that your word would come alive. It's living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, but I thank you that we would allow it to be alive in us, that we would open our hearts to the word. Lord, I pray that, that our ears would be open to your spirit and that you would take us exactly where you want us to go in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen. 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 I tell you what, we're going to read from uh, the, uh, the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or your phone, uh, go ahead and pull those out. And go, if you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. It's the first mention of marriage in Scripture. And we always want to pay attention to the first mention in the Bible because it's usually there and used by God to teach us something incredible about that subject. So when anytime we see something mentioned for the first time, in scripture, we always want to pay very close attention. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not Ashamed. It was not good for man to be alone. How many of you know for sure and for certain it is not good for men to be alone? I don't know where your weakness is or the place that uh, that ne you may need a little bit of help, but I know Brian's. He before he had me, it was a disaster in his house. I remember I, we were engaged to be married, and he had gone to Kentucky for Christmas break. I was still in Texas. And he called and he said, I forgot something in my apartment. Could you go in, get it, and, uh, and send it to me? And whenever he said that, I, I, I told him, yeah, I can do it. I said, Dad, come on, go with me. I'm going to go get something at Brian's house. So we went over to Brian's house. I unlocked the door. My dad is like OCD tidy. I mean, he, he, is, he has everything in its place and everything has a place. And we opened that door, and I remember my dad, he like stopped at the border of the door, and he said, Jesse, call 911. I said, 
Why? I said, Brian has been robbed. I said, no, Dad, he hasn't been robbed. This is just what he does. So it was, it was a mess. I should have known better. I, I knew the minute I saw it, I should have paid attention. But love is blind, right? That's funny. I've gotten a little better. I remember when I, I first was have going into ministry. Realize. A little better. Yep. She's made me a little better. We'll say it like that, all right? <laughs> uh, I remember when we were first going into the ministry, her father took me to the closet, his closet. And he said, son, I want to show you what your closet looks like has to look like if you're going to make it in ministry. So I look in his closet, and every shirt is organized by color, by season, by length of sleeve. Everything's lined out everywhere. And he's like, if you want to make it in ministry, you got to get this organized. And I thought, my Lord, I better find something else to do. But uh, <laughs> we, we, we started this church, and it took off. And I think it was like 2011, 2012. Uh, this church was one of the fastest-growing churches in America. And he came to the house, and I said, hey, pastor, come here. I want to show you something. And I, I brought him back to my bedroom, and I took him into my closet where my closet was all disheveled and messed up. I said, hey, you remember what you told me about that closet? I said, that's all wrong. Nothing about that's right. It's all wrong, man. <laughs> And so I got my sweet revenge. But listen, here's the deal. Sweet revenge, is, but you're still just, just a mess I'm in your closet. Um, it wasn't good for the man to be alone. No. And so God said, I'm going to make a helper suitable or comparable to Adam. And really, God makes Adam, puts Adam in the garden to tend and to keep it. And then he sees the holes really in Adam and the spots that aren't covered in Adam. And he says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for Adam. Here's what I believe in marriage. I believe that God, the Spirit of God, oversees us, and if we'll give ourselves to His wisdom. Now, you could go out and marry the worst person on earth, and God might have been saying no every moment of the way, but now you're married, and you're going to have to deal with that outside of abuse and some other things. But, but I think God tries to put us together with someone that can help us in our call, our destiny, our lane in life. And so Jesse is called by God to be my help me. And I really know this, that she is perfect for me. Now, I remember years ago, there was a guy that had a, a, another, uh, this guy was married. We were young couples. We're like in our 20s. And uh, we have them over to, to our house, and we're feeding them uh, uh, dinner, supper. Jesse cooked. And so the guy comes in, and this guy was kind of uh, a jerk. Yeah, a jerk. Or uh, could I say <laughs> overbearing at least? And, and so, like, I like uh, I like a woman with a little spunk, right? I like I like somebody that's got an opinion. That's kind of my mother was like that. That's what I'm. What's what I'm used to. And he comes in and he starts telling Jesse that you need to be less like you and more like my wife. And this guy didn't hardly let his wife talk. And uh, Jesse looked at me after they left and said he's never coming back to the house again, number one. And, and, and number two was this guy was kind of like, he had this stereotype of what a woman should be like in his mind. And he thought if every woman didn't line up and become exactly that, they weren't doing what God had called them to do. But here's what I recognize is that every woman is not called to be my help me. There's one woman that's been assigned to be my help me. Come on, somebody. And so she's got a, a, she learns me and does life with me. But it's not like you're designed to make everybody happy. It's just your husband. Come on, somebody say. <laughs> and all the ladies said amen yeah. to that. And some days it, it, it's just, it, it's just, it's unreal when people think that way. Yeah, and it's not that women are called to make someone happy. Only God can make Brian happy. Sure. But it, it, it is what it is what God has created us to become one and, and in doing that we have an assignment, a position that we do but I want to relieve a lot of the pressure because I'm only called to figure out one man. I am only called to love one man. I'm only called to figure out what makes him feel loved. I don't have to worry about what makes your husband feel loved. I'm not in charge of being married to him, but you are. And so that gives us only one person to study, only one person to get to know. Only one person becomes our hobby in life to learn to love well. And God entrusts us with a human being so that we will give to them out of the love that God has placed on the inside of us. And years ago, I just started asking, Asking God, God, 
I get mad at Brian. I see the holes in Brian. Help me to start. <laughs> it's true. Uh, help me to start loving Brian and help me to see him and love him like you see him and love him. The things that are important in him that you see as great things. Help me to ingest those, to go with those, to find the things that make him better, that make him more full, that make his love tank fill up and then allow me to be really good at that. And then I'm going to leave all of your husbands to you. See, that's where people go wrong. They're paying attention to everybody else's marriage and how they need to do their marriage instead of just making sure that we're a great student of the spouse that God has given into our life. So I think that's good. And, and that comes to our, really what we're talking about today is that invest to find fulfillment. Every single person has to invest in their marriage if they're ever going to be fulfilled out of their marriage. How many of you have figured out by now in life that there is absolutely nothing worth having in life that you don't have to make an investment in? That's good. I mean, if you're not sowing into it, you're not reaping anything. If you're not planting seeds, you are just going to get nothing. But if you're planting, things grow up in the garden of your marriage and you eat of the fruit of that. It's an incredible gift that God has given to us that we have the ability to invest. And a lot of times we don't really want to do that because it is time consuming and it can and it it really takes commitment and effort. But Adam had to put something into the relationship and we will too. If we're going to have a God marriage, Adam had to lose a rib for her. That was investment. You know, the, the chicken is excited about breakfast. The pig is committed, right? I mean, whenever someone's giving something, they're, they're investing in that. And I, I think there's a part of that that we all have to remember, that there is no way to have a God marriage without an investment, without making an investment in that. And in investing, we find a lot of fulfillment. In our, in our uh, kind of culture, people date, right? And it's not really in Scripture. We don't ever see that example there. But in America, that's kind of what we've done. We've decided to marry our kids off with arranged marriages. Yes, so we have. Uh, that's that's our plan for the future. But uh, but in our culture, in our generation, prom proposals are bigger than any marriage proposal that I ever saw in my lifetime. I mean, we're pushing people to date well. We're pushing people to be excited about who they date. Oh, you should take her to this new restaurant. Oh, you should wear this dress. We should get you dressed. We should have this outfit. If it's prom, we're decking everybody out, getting them the most expensive car. I mean, most of you had like cake, punch, and some nuts, and you drove away in like an old truck and with some cans on it, you know? And now their proms are are better than most weddings were back in the day. We are encouraging this thing where they invest in dating, invest in dating, invest in dating, invest in dating. But then I've seen it. You go to the first marriage shower, that wedding shower, that bridal shower, and someone says, oh, the old ball and chain. I hope you're ready to be bored for the rest of your life. It's like you're going to have no fun. You are going to be stuck in a trap, and you never get to have sex again. I mean, that's they just, like, make it into this hell that someone's going into with their, with their words. I have watched as newlyweds' faces have dropped, and they're like, oh, my goodness gracious. I'm going to be trapped. I'm going to have no fun because we see investment as a dating thing, and we don't see it in marriage. What would happen if we flip-flopped our mindset and we renewed our mind? according to the word of God and we invested in marriage like it should be invested in and not just dating like we think it should be. It's so big, you cannot get a harvest where you have not sown seed. Mm -mm. Let me say that again. You cannot get a harvest yeah. where you have not sown seed. Let me say that one more time. You cannot get a harvest, come on somebody, where you have not sown seed. Yeah. We got this idea that we're going we're gonna to sow in the dating game, sow like that, but once we get married, we're going to stop investing and everything's going to work out, and it's crazy. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. I preached this this last Wednesday night. Is uh, My family has a dog now because my children spiritually manipulated me into buying them a dog. And here's how they pulled it off. They, they know I'm a faith 
preacher and teacher. I teach about prayer all the time. And y'all probably heard me teach it. Whatever we ask the Father in the name of Jesus according to the will of God, our God will do for us. Somebody say amen Amen. to that. So I I preach that. Come on, ask uh, the Father in the name of Jesus according to the will of God. And you'll have what you ask. You'll have what you say. And so my kids catch on to that. And they come in at night when it's time to pray. And they start praying, Father, I thank you for a puppy. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I now believe I've received by faith that puppy. That puppy's coming. I declare I have it. It's now mine in my possession in Jesus' name. I thank you for it. I'll worship you in advance. They'll start all this now. <laughs> now, I thank you for the goodness of that puppy. I can hear him barking, smell him, <laughs> feel his fur. Puppy kisses are coming in Jesus' mighty <laughs> they'll be name. In, they'll and, be encouraging their siblings. And, Lift your voices like you already yeah, have yeah, it. like you already have it. And so it's like, okay, now I have a choice. I can either destroy my kid's faith or I can buy them a puppy. All right, I bought them a puppy. When they prayed for a cat, I decided I would destroy their faith instead of having the cat because cats are of the devil. So we got this, um, we got this, this dog in the house, and my little boy's nine. And I'll tell you, this dog loves me now. Doesn't matter where I go in the house, that dog is with me. If I go down in the basement, that dog lays at the, at the top of the basement doors. If I got the door shut. If I go in the bedroom, the dog comes and lays at the door. It's like a built-in security system. Nobody's getting through that door if I'm in there. He's there. And uh, he loves me. My little boy comes to me and he says, Dad, I-, I want another puppy. I said, I just got you a puppy. He said, yeah, but you and Briley have stolen the puppy from me. And he likes you more than he likes me. And I said, I can fix that for you. You want me to fix that for you? I'll show you how to fix it. This dog will love you. It's real simple. It's it's not rocket science. If you want a dog to love you, here's what you do, Justice. All you have to do is feed him, and he will love you. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about with the animal? How many parents uh, bought that dog for those kids, and that dog would starve to death if it weren't for you in the house, right? Come on. And that dog loves you now. And here's the deal. Whatever we feed in life will love us. And whatever we feed in life will grow. Can I get an amen? Here's what people do. They feed the relationship while they're dating. They feed it, and I'm not comparing your spouse to a dog right now, so Jesse, please don't get mad at me. If you feed the relationship while you're dating, but you stop feeding it when you're married, it's going to come up empty. You start withdrawing where you haven't made deposits. I'm going to tell you, if we'll feed what we're called to feed, our life will grow. If we'll feed what we're called to feed, our marriage will grow. If we'll feed what we're called to feed, come on, our spiritual life will grow. What have you been feeding? Because if I'm feeding the right stuff, the right stuff grows. If I'm feeding the wrong stuff, the wrong stuff grows. Man, I just want us to invest where we're called to invest. And, And here's some areas where we really should invest. We should invest in priority for our spouse. Yeah, if you sow priority into your spouse and they know that they are a big deal, covenant is bigger than family. We see family as our tribe. We're close to our family. We love our family. We treat our family good. We invest in our family. We spend time with our family. But a lot of times we prioritize just family over covenant. And it's important that we understand that through Scripture, covenant is better than priority. It is higher than Uh, than just family. Covenant is the biggest thing that God has given us dominion over and the biggest thing that he's called us to take care of. So we have to make it a priority. Two shall become one flesh. They shall leave their father and mother and cleave unto their wife. That means that when you get married, you leave your family system. Doesn't mean that you're ugly to them or that you leave them behind. You can still have relationship with them, but you no longer are part of that family system and priority, you have just left, and now you are a part of that covenant of marriage, and it's a major, major deal in the eyes of God. One day when we get to heaven, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and he'll ask us questions, and he's not going to say, did you hang out with your mom every day? 
He isn't going to say, did you say hang, that again? He isn't going to say, did you hang out with your mom every day? In fact, he's not going to ask you if you hang out with your drinking buddies every night. And what you, he might ask about that. I don't yeah, know. That'll be a different conversation. That might get you in trouble. Uh, but he, but you, you, we've got these clans that we want to be a part of. But God has called us to prioritize our covenant. He's going to ask us. He's going to sit us down and say, what did you do with the covenant of marriage in your life? Did you take dominion over that area? Did you prioritize it? You know, you got to make the main thing the main thing Brian and I are the main thing not for you but for us because if Brian and Jesse are okay they call us PB and J now it's like we share a brain I love peanut butter and jelly so that's fine with me those are our initials PB and J and they call us that all the time and it's almost like we're morphing into one cosmic consciousness you know we've been married almost 19 years next uh, month or two and 19 years of marriage will make you begin to be what what's this I they're laughing. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, funny. Next month or two, I guess. You don't uh, even know when we're married. That's what they're laughing oh, about. Oh, I don't know our anniversary. That's no new news. I'm the one who has problems with dates. He wasn't even shocked. Yeah, uh, yeah. I did forget our wedding anniversary. We got married once. in the spring or the fall. Or <laughs> it was raining. I'm not uh-huh. very good with dates. I'm not very good with birthdays. I, I'm just saying it's not mine. But yeah, yeah, May 13th, I do That's know our the anniversary. Day. Give That's me a high five day. right Come on, there. 19 years. All right. So uh, 19, I was like, why is everyone laughing at me? That was why. Uh, but we, we've we started just becoming one person, one mind, one heart. And that's the way God created it to be so that you can dwell together in some sort of unity and peace with one another. We're called by God to pre- prioritize it. We used to have a, a, a person that we knew um, years and years ago. And he would ask his mother-in-law to give them a little space. But instead, she gave them a lot of FaceTime. She really was, you know, there. And every single day when this man would get home, his mother-in-law would already be in the house. And she wouldn't leave until it was time to go to bed. Well, how many of you can see how that could become a problem? Just a little bit of a problem with you. You That would make you pray for the second coming of Christ. It's like, (laughs) come quickly, Lord Jesus, right? Huh? Yeah, so we, we have to prioritize that. And that's, that's it, just prioritizing, making the main thing the main thing. If Brian and I are okay, our kids are okay. It's good. If Brian and I are doing well, the church does well. If Brian and I are doing well, our, our businesses do well. If Brian and I are doing well, the house does well. If Brian and I are doing well, everything is okay. If Brian and I are broken, Every single thing is broken. So prioritizing that allows you to build health and strength in your marriage and in your home so that when you do have a demand on you from even other family members, maybe say your parents are aging and they need help in that season of their life. Whenever you have the health in your marriage, then you're able then to give of yourself without breaking the main thing so that you can do what it is that God has called you to do. But we have to prioritize what we're building right now yeah prioritizing this above everything else whether it's it's family whether it's relationship whether it's work man I I watch work and and I believe we should be the hardest working people in showbiz how many all think Christians we ought to work circles around the rest of the world every day every week say I I believe I believe in hard work and uh, I, I was raised that way. It's in my DNA. Uh, got family here in the room, but like it was a sin to sleep past seven in the house I was raised in, right? It was like you go to work, and, and once you had got your work hard, it was okay. Work done, you could play hard, you could work hard, as long as you worked hard. But, but I've watched work at times get in the way of this. And people will be working to come up with money or come up with, with security or something else. And I'm for that. I, I, I love guys that get after it, ladies that get after it and work hard. But I mean, you know, if we put all of our eggs in the work basket, come on, there's not even going to be a family left whenever we get home. So you got to find a way to prioritize that. That leads us to our, to our next uh, real point is you have to invest by sowing time. First thing we talked about was invest by sowing priority. If your spouse knows they come first, there's a real um, security to that. There's a love to that. There's, there's knowing that they're taken care of. That's there. And the way you do that is by investing time. Come on, everybody say time. Time, time is a massive thing. We started the church and kind of that, 
I almost do have a workaholic side to me. Both me and Jesse are like that. And we kind of we kind of got in planning this church. And uh, in the early days of church planning, you're everything, man. You're you're the marketing director, right? Uh, we we kind of we put billboards around the town back then. Uh, we got some money together to advertise the church was coming, and there was a phone number on those billboards, and that phone number was my personal cell phone. So my cell phone was all over the country for everybody in Owensboro. And then I was the janitor. We were the kids directors. We were the youth directors. We were the, uh, Jesse did the music. And, and time just kept coming. So, so I started working for the church after about six months of when we started. Jesse came on about a year into it because God was blessing the church and I needed the help. And uh, we were together all the time. But how many of you have recognized that being together and being together are not the same thing. All the ladies said, amen. amen. Let me say it again. Being together and being together are not the same thing. How many of you have ever been in the room with your family or in the room with your spouse, but your mind is at the workplace? Have you ever been in the room with them, but your mind is on the bank accounts, right? Thinking about the money. You've been in the room, but your mind is somewhere else. And uh, we were working so hard back then, we were together, but, but Jesse started coming to me and saying, Brian, uh, I need more time with you. And as a guy, I didn't get it at first. Most of the time, a lot of people respond like this, and I think this is immature, and uh, I was there back then, and so I was immature. But if she would come and tell me she needs something, the first thing that I would respond with is kind of offense and anger. And some people will deflect like this. It's almost like, were you saying I'm a bad husband? No, that's not what they're saying. They're saying we have an issue we need to work on. Yeah. Does that make sense? If you respond like that and nobody can commu commu communicate to you, you shut down those lines of communication. So I kind of felt that way, and, and, and then she kept saying and saying, hey, I need time with you. And I started to realize that I was there, but I wasn't there. We were together, but we weren't together. Yeah. So we had to come up with a system to work on that. Yeah, and I, I, I wasn't trying to be hard on him, but I think at the time I thought, does he not want to spend real time with me? He just wants me to work for him. I'm just an employee, you know. And he and he was reacting, but really now that I look back on it, he was reacting because he just didn't have an answer. And I think a lot of times we react because we just don't know what to do. It's like, I don't know what you want from me. I'm giving you all I've got, every, every tool in my tool belt. I'm using it right now, and I don't have anything left to give you. And he felt like that. He felt frustrated, and he felt challenged, and he felt like he had to do something. And I didn't know how we were going to fix it either, but I knew that if we didn't fix it, that over the years that it was going to break down and it wouldn't be good. And so I just kept mentioning it until one day we were in front of our pastors, and we love them. They're so good to speak into us. And we were, I think, having lunch or something one day, and we all Always, if we know someone that has a good marriage, we are interviewing you. If you have a good marriage, you do not want to get in front of us if we have a notepad in our hand because we are going to figure out what it is that made you still like each other after 50 years. Like, that's our jam. So here I am. I'm putting all these things. I'm, I'm listening to everything that they're telling me. And they began to teach us about something that changed our life forever. And we always share it in these sessions because it made a massive difference in our relationship and continues to do so today. When we use it, today, our marriage is better. And when we refuse to use the tool that we have, our marriage does not do as well. And we can yep. see it in the practical realm. We know what we're doing wrong is that we're not using our time well. They call it the law of seven. And so today I want to share it with you. Um, we have uh, added one to the beginning of it in that Brian and I try a couple of times a day while we're awake. You don't have to wake up in the night. You don't have to set an alarm. But a couple of times a day, about every seven hours, we choose to verbally communicate respect respect, adoration, or love to one another. You know, a lot of people go their entire life and they never hear the words, I'm proud of you, or I love you, or you're good at what you do. Man, you're an incredible teacher. I really appreciate the way that you take care of our family. You're a great uh, provider. Thank you so much for going to work every day and making it happen for our family. Uh, hey, you're, you're good looking. You look nice today. Those kinds of things people go years and years and years and they're deficient on 
and they're the easiest thing in the world to come up with. We don't set an alarm and make it sterile and weird like you, I love you. You know, like you don't want to be weird about says, it. My says, I love you right now. I uh, love you. But if you have to for a few weeks, I promise you to get it in your habits, your spouse will go ahead and deal with your sterileness for right now because that's just a weird, awkward thing. But if you will invest in making that a priority about every seven hours, we try to invest words of affirmation, it's love, twice a day. and respect twice a day. Uh, every seven days, we make it a priority to take a couple hours and to go on a date. N depending on your time in life, your season in life, whatever that may be, you may have to do this different. There were times that we had an hour after everyone went to bed and we shared a Coke and we sat down and we communicated. But the first thing we have to do is put our phone down. I know some of you just went through like withdrawals. It was like your whole body just shook. But we put the phone down, we shut everything off, and we look each other in the eye. And you may say, I don't even like my spouse right now. I don't think I can do this. But I want to challenge you this week with an action step. Just 20, <laughs> if you've watched this movie, you'll think it's funny. If not, just listen. But just 20 seconds of uninterrupted eye contact. And then just go ahead and eat your meal, but do it in silence if you have to at first. See, it's an investment. And God sees you honoring the concept, and he brings anointing on you to be married. He gives you extra special grace to That's do good. better when you show God that you're giving him what you have in your hand today. So every seven days we do that. Every seven weeks we try and we encourage people to take a night away. Maybe you'll take a night in and send the kids to grandma's. Maybe you have a friend that you have to swap out a babysitting arrangements with. Maybe you're an empty nester and you guys haven't looked at each other in at least six years. It's time to connect and make an opportunity happen where the TV's not on and your voice are speaking to one another instead of not looking at one another. And then the next one, every seven months, we try to take a couple of three days away and we invest in what God has given to us. Again, that can adapt to your life and time. But how many of you think if we would take the time to invest in the priority in our home, which is that marriage, that God could have his way in us and do some pretty incredible things with our marriage? Come on. How many of y'all want to give the Lord a hand clap for sending your kids to grandma's? Come on, we really want to give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, grandma, take the kids for two or three days. Listen, uh, we believe this is we believe that, that what you invest in is the field you're going to reap out of. It's all we're trying to communicate today. Yeah. If we'll invest in what matters, I'll tell you, you can have a great marriage. And you may be saying, Pastor, you don't understand where our marriage is right now. We are frustrated with one another. We don't communicate well. We, we're, we're messed up. We're angry. We're hurt. We're bitter. I want you to know this today, that the Spirit of God can work a great work in your family and in your marriage. You don't have to stay where you are in the future. But what's it going to take? Well, it's been a journey that's brought you to this place, right? The only way we get where we are is there's been a journey that's brought us to this place. Maybe it was the wrong kind of, of investment or lack of investment, Maybe we didn't do what we were called to do, but I'm telling you what, it's amazing how fast God can turn things around. Yeah. I've watched people that, that it was over. Man, stick a fork in it, it's done, this thing is, is cashed out. I've watched God turn it around supernaturally. Yeah. And it started with somebody making a decision and somebody deciding we're going to do things different. And little by little, bit by bit, just the way they walked into the woods, they turn around and they start walking out. And I've seen the grace of God and the favor of God. Man, just flow into those marriages and flow into those households and put back what the devil tried to tear apart, put it back together. I want you to stand up on your feet. I want to I get to pray for you. Then we're going we're gonna to have a baptism right after this prayer. So stay with us, all right? It's going to be exciting. We're going we're gonna to have a water baptism after this prayer. But if you're, if you're standing by your spouse, go ahead and grab, grab their hand. I want you to hold their hand. Uh, don't hold a stranger's hand. I've said that a couple times. Be real awkward at this part in the service. And I'm going to pray for the blessing of God. Yeah. I'm going to pray for the good marriages to get even stronger. Now I'm going to pray for anybody that's struggling this morning. The man that the Spirit of God, the touch of God, would just come to that, that relationship, come to your house, come to your marriage, and start a healing process now. Man, God does all things well. Come on. Just, just If you're comfortable with it, those of you, 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 you may not be holding anybody's hand. You might want to lift a hand to heaven. Just honor God's presence right now. 
Father, I thank you for the people under the sound of my voice, and I thank you for these marriages. Lord, I thank you what you put together, let no man put us under. Lord, I bless every person, every man, every woman. And I pray for a grace to come. I pray for a grace to come. Lord, teach us to be good husbands and to be good wives. Lord, show us how to do family. Show us how to do it well. Lord, I speak a blessing over these households. I come against the work of the enemy. What the devil's tried to use to destroy and to bring a wedge and to push apart, I pray that it would be broken now by the power of the Holy Spirit. I declare the anointing of God's coming, and it's, it's taking away all the dross, and it's leaving only the precious, pure things, the gold and the silver. Lord, I thank you now that you begin to show us what to do. Give us faith actions. Lord, let us not just talk about it, let us act on it. I pray that we would put these things in action, that a real healing and a strength could come to our relationship. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I bless these, your people. Come on, let's give God a hand clap.